doing, everybody? Hey, hey, hey. It's Wolf 10 Podcast time. Hey, hey. Good to see you. Uh, how you doing? I'm good. How are you? <laughs> oh, it's great. Yeah. Uh, I got home about five minutes ago. Uh, Where were you that you couldn't? I was, uh, I was four by four and I was oh, off, you, you I was doing off that wheeling. stuff. There yeah, you go. Bro. It One was time. sick. <laughs> it was freaking sick. Zim didn't like it. A uh, little pause too hot on the hot sand. Mm. Uh, I he, can see that. But he pissed on everything. Of course. Pissing like he was, he's, he's 14 pounds of piss. <laughs> You took your car? Yeah. Doing? Okay. How, the lease. How did, how did it handle <laughs> on the roads? Fine. Okay. I mean, it was it, it, it was a very uh, uh, easy trail. Okay. There was nothing. Okay. There was no funny business going on. So there was yeah. basically any four-wheel car right. could have, would have been fine. I mean, it helped that it's, you know, high up yeah. off the ground. Because, like, I know, because you have a modern four-door hybrid Wrangler. Yeah. And we've done off-roading in an older two-door wrangler gotta be honest relatively the same okay pretty much exactly the same because that one was i think just as tall yeah the old old one yeah uh yeah it was like the same okay by the time i got out there i had no electric charge anyway so (laughs) the electric didn't really matter Mm -hmm. uh i mean it was smoother because it's a newer car but otherwise it's basically exactly the same it was fun. Just slamming my head against the wall every time i hit a bump welcome to the wolf den podcast your premiere off-roading automotive podcast <laughs> number two only to jalopnik and auto trends did you hear all of the like auto uh car youtube channels are like go they all like apparently they're all under this conglomerate called donut okay and they all left really yeah there was like a big exodus to do I, I don't really know oh, the man. details i don't watch a lot of these car channels. well if donut wants to hire us then the premier uh off-roading automotive podcast <laughs> You could. We're, we're we're ready to sell out. Is what oh, I'm trying to yeah, say, baby. Wow, you got a Jeep and not a Cybertruck. I saw two Cybertrucks today. I drive past a Cybertruck every time I take my daughter to school. It's like parked right like on the side street. I take. It looks even dumber, like in real life. I think it looks wild, and I kind of like it. But if I had one, I would feel like such an asshole. It looks wild in the sense that it looks dumb. And today I was almost late because somebody was driving real slow with their phone out taking pictures of it. I like kind of, I kind of like how, I kind of like how it looks like it hasn't rendered in. I, I did see a picture was like that next to like a a minivan sale, and then the caption was PS One graphics versus PS Five graphics. Yeah, that's exactly what yeah. it is. Um. All right. Anyway, thank you to a lot of people here. <laughs> DJ Skeletor, thanks for the five months. Rock and Val, how you doing? Thanks for the forty eight months. Lorian, thanks for the 10 months. Here's to another great month, boys. Hopefully, your make switch comes in the mail soon, Bob. Well, I got news oh, for you. Funny you should say that. I got it right here. Yeah. Um, what else? Uh, uh, 1995 Poppy, thanks for the 16 months. Let's go. Warheart, thanks for the gift of sub. S. Scrimma, thanks for the five months. Podcast day, let's go. Silent Kid, thanks for the prime. John McCheese, thanks for the 18 months. And we got Super Chat. Yes, yeah, so over on YouTube, we got Farmer Gooch with the five bucks and Michelle, $2. Love you, Wolf Bros. Thanks, guys. And yeah. Mega Dragon, thanks for the prime. Everybody, thank you so much. Love you so much. If you're of age, let's get right to <laughs> the news that we have here. The yes. first thing that we have here is oh, wait. July PlayStation Plus. Yes. Brand new month. Yeah. Brand new month. Brand July new free is games. here. We got new games to get if you're subscribed to PlayStation Plus. Um, and I don't know if I would call this an exciting month. Your mileage may vary, of course. We have on PS4 and PS5, Borderlands 3. On PS4 and PS5, NHL 24. And uh, PS4 and PS5, Among Us. Boo. <laughs> Bad month. Uh, Borderlands 3, fine. Sure, whatever. Uh, I haven't played Borderlands in a hot minute, uh, but I feel like Borderlands 3 is fine. I just don't like Gearbox. Yeah. I, I, I like abstained from playing these games because uh, Gearbox got shitty. Yeah. Um, NHL 24. I mean, I've heard the hockey games are good. I haven't played an NHL game in God knows how long, so uh, whatever. You could play Among Us on your phone. Yeah. <laughs> Among Us is like $5 on every platform. Um, I mean, it's nice that they're just giving it away as part of your subscription, but like... Has the has the moment passed on Among Us? Yes. P- 
People still play it. Yeah, I know uh, people still play it. I know they're still releasing content for it. I but. it's not in the zeitgeist anymore. Yeah. I mean, they release like new maps every once in a while, but I, I would imagine they'd probably be working on it a was, new game by it now. It was featured in the the hit movie Glass Onion. Really? Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah. It was, they played in the beginning. It was uh Daniel Craig's character plays it with like Angela Lansbury and Stephen Sondheim, you know, actual famous people. Um, it was funny. That was he, a good. Did bit. he win it? Because... No, he was very bad at it. Really? Yes. <laughs> uh, Mason Phillips, thank you for the ten dollars on super chats. My Wolf Den dads telling me about cars like True Fathers. That's right. I took my car in to get the New York State inspected because in New York State you have to get your car inspected, and Dad. Uh, our father uh, told me I screwed up because I should have also asked for an oil change at the same time. I was, but there. I don't. I don't need an oil change, so I didn't need to you ask. Screwed for it. up. You gotta get it all done. Y'all, I hate everybody. <laughs> um. All right, let's get into the main topic, which is about modded hardware, aka the people that I bought my MIG switch <laughs> from. Yeah, and I was very upset about because it's a very sketchy website. Yes. You, I ordered this, not a peep from them mm -hmm. for months, and other people are getting theirs, and I'm like, I guess I got scammed because mm -hmm. there's no way of you knowing yeah. if it's coming. And then, right as I said that, it showed up at the PO box. Yeah. Um, I have not opened it or used it because I don't see a purpose without the dumper. Right. Uh, you, I don't have a modded switch. So you, said, so you said dumper, mm -hmm. and you know that word triggers me. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go in a laughing pit, so I'm just trying to get zen now. <laughs> okay, so I'm you sorry. don't start saying dumper 50 times. I'm sorry. I don't go. have... Okay. Let me know when you're ready. Go. I don't have a regular... I don't have a modded switch. So I can't dump my games. <laughs> I have no way of dumping. So... Are you okay? I'm fine. Okay. Go keep going. <laughs> so I'm not going to open this because I have no way to put any games on right. here. So okay. I'm waiting for the dumper that I also <laughs> ordered from Modded Hardware, right. which is apparently about to be shut down. <laughs> yes. So this is an article from Torrent Freak. Mm -hmm. um, and it says, Jay Buggy, thanks for the Prime subscription. No. Uh, it's, uh, I'm going to skip, I guess, the italicized. Uh, no, I guess that's the important part. Yeah. Nintendo has filed two lawsuits at Washington federal court targeting individuals who allegedly facilitated Nintendo Switch piracy. The lawsuit accused modded hardware of violating DMCA by selling mod chips and MIG devices, which is the thing that I have, mm -hmm. as well as shipped shipping modded consoles with pirated games. That's the part. Yes. That definitely fucked them. Mm -hmm. The second complaint accuses Archbox a moderator of r slash switch pirates on reddit of facilitating piracy and operating various pirate shops nintendo is doing everything in its power to stop the public from playing pirated uh games on the switch console the japanese gaming company won several lawsuits in in recent history shutting down websites that distributed pirated roms the most notable perhaps was the criminal a referral that resulted in the demise of the infamous hacking group Team Executor. The group released several jailbreak hacks for gaming consoles in the past and was widely regarded as Nintendo's main nemesis. With the win against Team Executor, Nintendo hoped that mod the modding scene would fade into oblivion, but that's not what happened in recent years. New tools and hardware solutions were released, requiring Nintendo to gas the enforcement pedal once again. Uh, for example, recently Nintendo uh, filed lawsuits against uh, Yuzu, Lockpick, and now MIG Switch. Nintendo versus modded hardware. Nintendo also targeted modern hardware behind the scenes. I guess not behind the scenes. They're here right now with a lawsuit that everybody can see. The gaming giant reached out to its alleged owner and operator, Michigan resident Ryan Daly, who also operates under the alias Homebrew Homie. In March, Nintendo threatened to sue him. After which both parties agreed that the allegedly unlawful activity, which includes selling MIG devices and modded consoles, would stop. Despite this agreement, modded hardware didn't close shop. That led to further outreach by Nintendo earlier this month, after which it still remained online. They didn't shut down modded right. hardware. 
Daly said that he was looking for a new lawyer, but Nintendo's patience had run out and it followed up with a lawsuit. In a complaint filed in, at federal court in Seattle, Washington, Nintendo accuses modern hardware of copyright infringement and of violating the DMCA by trafficking in circumvention devices, among other things. So here is the lawsuit. Uh, I posted this on Twitter yesterday. The complaint is for trafficking in circumvention devices, which is the mix. Right. Trafficking in circumvention devices, again. Copyright infringement. Con- contributed con- Contributory copyright infringement. Breach of contract. Violation of EULA. Torch. Tor- Torchious. Interface with contract. I don't know what that means. Torchious. Oh. In the... The picture. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Uh, the big one is that they were selling consoles that had games yeah. on them already. That is, of course, a great way to get sued by Nintendo. Torchious. Adjective. Implying or involving tort. <laughs> All right. There you go. Of course. Yes. It's so obvious. Um, Tort is a wrongful act other than a breach of contract with, uh, for which relief may be obtained in form in the form of damages or an injunction. Torchious interface with contract. So they did something wrong. Yes. Uh, to, to, uh, towards the contract, which would yes. be the EULA. Yes. I really, really hate uh, the EULA stuff. Yeah. That should not be enforceable. That's how, that's how they get you. Well, yeah, yeah it is enforceable because it's a contract. That's how they get yeah, it's you. It's a bullshit-ass contract. Yeah, but it's a, it's a contract the DMCA, stuff that's in the EULA cannot contradict stuff that's in the DMCA. Right. Yeah. But there's just so much stuff yes. that it's so confusing that they can mm-hmm. bury it all. And because Nintendo has all the good lawyers and Ryan Daly has a bad lawyer, <laughs> he's going to get fucked. Yes. Um... Anyway, trafficking in circumvention devices is also, uh, that's terrible. If, yeah. if, that, if, if they win on that count, I'll, that's going to set a really bad precedent, and a lot of things are going to yeah. get screwed up after that. Mm-hmm. Same thing with the EULA stuff. They yeah. win on that count, that's going to be pretty bad, too. Copyright infringement, yeah. I mean, they should probably eat that one, because yeah. they were selling devices with, with mm-hmm. uh, stuff on it. Now, I don't know if this is in this article, um, but uh, there was some speculation that uh, Nintendo is trying to get modded hardware to give them a list of recipients. Okay. So the people who purchased their MIG switches, (laughs) they would get a list of names and addresses and and email addresses <laughs> yeah <laughs> which would be catastrophic yes because that means that then they can target each individual person that bought one yes <sighs> this is reminding me a lot of back in the days when of napster and limewire where like the record labels would target the individual people who were yeah. downloading music and like hit them with multi-million dollar lawsuits like effectively children who were using family computers to yeah. download music they would target the entire family for it um that has since stopped and now they're more concerned with shutting down whole websites rather than going after individual people because they know that's terrible press. yes yeah. that that yeah. well, makes you look it took horrible. them years to figure that yeah. out and I'm afraid that it's going to take Nintendo even longer because they are very slow to realize to read the room. You know what I mean? Yeah, so. no, absolutely. I mean, I could see them wanting a list of the distributors or something. But the, again, this is one of the distributors. Yeah. Like, it's not like uh, maybe if somebody bought in bulk of these things, yeah. then they can go after them. But I thought modded hardware looked like a sketchy website and I've never heard of them before. So I sent this to the P.O. box. Yeah. But... um my name was still on it like right. because the p.o box needs to know my name yeah. <laughs> like when i go pick it up yeah so still there's potential that nintendo could run that list through their own list of people who have accounts on their website yeah. and just start blocking people or seeing if they have uh 
uh, uh, pirated games. Yeah. You know? One of the, so I tweeted about this and a lot of replies were like, good, the MIG switch is really bad for the used game market because people can just dump all of their games onto their MIG switch and then yeah. sell the game, uh, GameStop. And if you put that game that you just bought from GameStop into your Switch, you could get banned mm -hmm. because someone else is playing it somewhere else on their MIG Switch, right. um, which is true. That is bad for the used game market. Yeah. First of all, <laughs> uh, it's it, it feels like a, a I don't want to say necessary evil, mm -hmm. but that these things happen. Yeah. Um, also. Why? I think it's a bad argument because why would I, if I dump a game on my mix switch yeah. and I sell it to GameStop, I now can't play that game either. Yeah, because I will also get banned. So it that's just yeah. doesn't make any sense. So there will be people who do that, but it, it they're shooting themselves in the foot by doing mm -hmm. that. So I th I don't think that that p argument holds any weight. Right. Um. What else? There's also uh, Archbox, which uh, got, I don't know, he got hit with something. In addition to a modded uh, hardware lawsuit, Nintendo also filed a complaint at the Washington Federal Court against Arizona resident James Williams, known online as Archbox. According to Nintendo, Archbox is connected to several pirate shops through which copies of unauthorized games are distributed defendant is the operator overseer and driving force behind several pirate shops through which defendant has offered massive libraries of pirated nintendo switch games the complaint reads in addition to running these pirate shops the defendant allegedly helped people to obtain and use circumvention software so they could play pirated games this activity was allegedly boosted through the pi the Switch Pirate subreddit, which Archbox was a moderator. Quote, defendant, becoming, defendant became a leading, if not primary moderator of the Switch Pirates Reddit community, which he helped grow to nearly 190,000 members. Since 2019, defendant has posted thousands of comments and messages to the Switch Pirates Reddit group. Defendant's uh, posts have included by way of example messages directing users to you to the pirate shops and offering technical advice and encouragement to other users about how to use the pirate shops how to download and install circumvention software and how to play pirated copies of nintendo switch mm -hmm. so that's the focus on uh showing how to use the circumvention software is also pretty scary because yeah. that means people with YouTube channels where they show people, <laughs> of, you know, how uh, all the different cool hardware they can use yeah. to play emulated games. That means all of those people could get dinged for, yeah. for this. The big thing is that he was showing, he was giving people libraries of games. Yeah. And that's the running theme here is that Nintendo seems to just go after people who have, uh, who are, who are distributing pirated games mm -hmm. but they're tacking on all of this other stuff that they eventually they could just get people for that they're casting a wide net yeah. they're they're throwing it out there to see what they can catch and what they can you know well, essentially get away with well they're hitting them with the most damning one with the one that they know they can get away with yeah and then they're tacking on all the other bullshit right and eventually all the other bullshit will stand on his own because yeah. there'll be enough president for all that other bullshit because yeah. they'll have won that so much in the past so that's what's scary about this mm -hmm. it, i mean once again don't distribute <laughs> games don't mm -hmm. give out games for free that's a that's how you're gonna get in trouble and, I, and you're gonna fuck up this whole industry for the rest of us yeah by giving out those games there are ways to obtain these games legally uh that being said, I will never get my dumper <laughs> because uh, I bought it from modded hardware, right? And I still haven't seen it. Mm -hmm. So that me now that they're being sued, I will probably never see it, yeah. and I probably won't see my sixty dollars either. Oof! So. That could have been a game. That could have been, been a game. That could have been a game. That could have <laughs> been a game. 
see all this work for nothing you could have spent that money to get yourself a good ass game or you spend that money to get the potential to download a bunch of games but that could also yeah. make you a criminal um unrelated to this mm -hmm. the mig switch website has been down i think okay <laughs> Oh, yeah, now they're probably going into hiding. Well, they're Russian. <clears throat> right. Uh, so I don't think it's possible for them to, <laughs> to, yeah. to be taken down. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. I, 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 it wasn't working for, for some reason. That being said, MIG Switch, the, the manufacturer, mm -hmm. the people who are making these things, seem to be fine other than their website was down for some right. reason. Uh, this is just one of the distributors of the MIG Switch. Mm-hmm. Illmaster says, page 23 of the Modern Hardware lawsuit requiring defendant to provide Nintendo of America with any and all invoices, purchase orders, shipping confirmation receipts, and any other documentation reflecting revenue received by defendant in connection with the Circumvention Devices Act consoles. So, that's not speculation. It's straight up in the lawsuit. Mm -hmm. They uh, are asking for all of the information of everybody who's bought one right shipping confirmate i mean their argument is going to be that they just want uh whoever they they, they want to know who how many people got one so yeah. that they can say you owe us x amount of dollars because you cost us x amount of dollars in damages yeah. for selling x amount of mig switches that'll be their argument but that they're potentially going to receive a lot more information than they need for that argument and they could do a lot with that information so hopefully um i would love to say that our government will uh our j judicial system will protect us i don't know if you've been keeping up with the news <laughs> but our judicial system is going through something right now no, it's really so, it's really fucking up yeah there's some we're fucked <laughs> Rakia X Play. Thank you for the seven months. The thing with the dumper can create the potential of counterfeit switch carts. Yes. Um. Yeah. Because you can dump the ROM and then you can't re-put something on the. You would need a flash cart. Okay. Like a MIG switch. Yeah. Correct, Willow Davis. This podcast is not legal advice. You can get the dumper off of AliExpress. Okay, I will do there that. There you go. Thank you so much. FYI, Bob's camera needs... Nah, just squinting. <laughs> um, all right, that's it for the for the big switch stuff. Yeah. Uh, so if you ordered one, uh, I'm sorry. And if you didn't order one, good on you. Good on you. Congratulations. You, you, you survived. Uh, all right. Next news. Keeping with Nintendo, they have a plan to combat scalpers. Oh. Oh, this is, you'll never believe what their sec super secret amazing plan is. Oh, they uh, had a another financial briefing? Yes. Uh, Nintendo has a plan to combat potential scalpers of its Switch successor, one that boils down to making certain that there are enough units available to satisfy the demand when it's eventually released. In a Q&A session during a shareholder meeting, Nintendo President Shintaro Furukawa explained how the company will take on the reseller market. As a countermeasure against resale, we believe that the most important thing is to produce a sufficient number to meet customer demand. And this idea has not changed since last year, Furukawa said, translated by IGN. Uh, in addition to this, we are considering whether there are any other measures that can be taken to extend uh, to the extent allowed by laws and regulations taking uh, into under the circumstances of each reason of each region. Uh, at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, Switch consoles became sought-after items. The global semiconductor shortage in 2021 saw supply shrink. But echoing previous statements regarding availability, Furukawa added that Nintendo is anticipating that it'll have enough stock to combat scalpers. Although we are unable to produce sufficient quantities of the Nintendo Switch hardware last year and the year before during uh, due to the shortage of semiconductors, uh, this situation has now been resolved, Furukawa said. At this time, we do not believe that the shortage of components will have a significant impact on the production of the successor model. 
Several months ago, Nintendo confirmed that a Switch successor was in development and that the Switch 2 would be announced during the company's uh, current fiscal year, ending in March 2025. Uh, the Switch successor comes at a time when the Switch hardware sales have begun to decline, but with 141.32 million consoles and over 1.2 billion games sold as of March 31st this year, the Switch has a terrific run so far. Uh, here's hoping the successor is backwards compatible so fans can keep playing their I would imagine that they would have a lot more in production than the original Switch because that they weren't anticipating to sell that well. Right. They <clears throat> uh, were hoping that it would sell really well, mm -hmm. but the Wii U sold so poorly, they didn't, really just didn't have money. I mean, it, I think it makes <laughs> sense to like have, you know, to, the, the, uh, to combat scalpers, just produce enough so that everybody gets their hands on them. Yeah. You know, I know it's hard, like, in the beginning, because, like, you don't really know, like, how much you need. And the Switch was so successful that pe people are going to want to get the next thing, even if, yeah. you know, especially if it's similar enough to the last thing. I think that they definitely will have more Switch units in production. Or mm -hmm. I'm sorry, they will have more Switch 2 units in production than they did Switch 1 units at launch. However... Mm -hmm. There will not be enough Switch 2 units when it launches. Probably I, not. I think that they're going to underproduce a little bit. Because there's still going to be scalpers. There's still going to be those dudes who like yeah. grab it immediately and try to flip it on eBay. Yeah. You know, you, you just want to make sure that there's enough so that Best Buy always has at least one left. And then yeah. they get another one the next day. Yeah, and at first there's going to be people who are scooping them up no yeah. matter what. Because at the bare minimum, they can make their money back. Yeah. Um. But not just that, I think that they're going to just, they could lose a lot of money if they produce too much. Yeah. And they just won't. Mm -hmm. Chances are they're not going to do that. I mean, Sony sold so many PlayStation 5s and you never saw them in stores. Yeah. So that could happen with the Switch 2 mm -hmm. as, as well. And once again, we have no idea when the hell we're going to see this Switch 2. Yeah. Um. I think they also mentioned that they were open to other ways of of uh, uh getting rid of scalpers. Yeah. Uh they sort of alluded to uh like their account system or something or some yeah. weird thing, like some verification process, but if you want to sell it at Best Buy, there's really not much you can do. People are going to yeah. just have alerts on and just keep buying them from Best Buy. It'd be cool if we could buy them direct from Nintendo. Yeah. That'd be that'd be cool. I think Valve it was annoying for some people. Yeah. <laughs> but I didn't hate their system. Like, yeah, like, like it made sense. Have especially... an account for more than a month. Yeah. And you get one. Yes. <laughs> it, it wasn't just, I think you also had to have made a purchase. Like, yeah, you have to recently. have an yeah. active account. Because like I had an account for like years, but I didn't make a, a purchase for like years when yeah. the Steam Deck came out. Now I'm making purchases left and right because I'm a PC gamer now. <laughs> There's summer sales going on, oh, and it's no. scary shit because The Witcher is like $2 right now, The Witcher 3, and I almost bought it, but I'm thinking to myself, I'm never going to play this No, game. I am not interested in playing The Witcher. If Cyberpunk was on sale for $2, maybe I would get back into it because that's more of my speed. But like, what am I doing here? Like, who have I become? No. I have my wish list stuff. I haven't even looked yeah. at it. I'm too afraid I've got a couple it. things in my cart because it's like there's a lot of good shit right now. Children of the Sun. Have you played that? I have the demo for it. All right, I, oh, I play haven't that. played. Maybe I'll play that. That it, looks really good. I just beat the game I was playing on Steam Deck, so now I need a new game. Maybe what I'll was, play. What was the other American game? Arcadia? Okay. Yeah. So what maybe, is that? It's uh, it's, it's like a retro style. It's a half two D game and a half first person puzzle adventure, where like the world isn't what you think it is. And like it just reveals more and more about like you're part of a TV show and you're trying to escape from it. Oh. It's actually pretty cool. Okay. Yeah. It's you know it's in our shared library, so we can give them a shot. Oh, I forgot about and if, that. And if it's in our back, if it comes up on the backlog, oh boy, look at oh boy. <laughs> I just put up a short today about uh, a bunch of five games yes. that are free on Steam. And I meant to download all of those, and I didn't. <laughs> which is great, and it's doing the short is doing well. Yeah. Which is awesome because that short is like two months old. <laughs> I, ju <laughs> I just posted it today for some reason. Yeah. Uh, but all those demos, I'm pretty sure, are still good. Yeah. Uh. Anyway, where are we at? We got uh more notifications. We got Jeffrey Sorensen. Thanks for the 36 months. Hooray for three years. Thank you for being you. Well, thank you for your support. All right. Next news.
we got some stuff from Microsoft. Yes. Microsoft's canceled Xbox Cloud Console gets details in a new patent. Ooh. I love these little patent sketches. Yeah. Uh, a few years ago, Microsoft was planning to launch a dedicated Xbox Cloud Console codenamed Keystone. The device looked like a miniature Series S, a small white box that was dedicated to accessing Xbox games over the company's Xbox Cloud Gaming Service. Keystone sounds a little too close to Kidney Stone. I mean, it's not. <laughs> Like Keystone is a place. <laughs> okay. Uh, Microsoft eventually canceled its plans but to launch. But it's like white. Okay. <laughs> well, go, it, go. it never came out, so you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> no, you do have to worry about it. If it never came out. <laughs> Damn it. Go on. Go uh, on. <laughs> a new patent gives us uh, the best look at what the cloud console would have looked like. Spotted by Windows Central, the patent reveals that Keystone would have shipped with an HDMI port, Ethernet port, and power connector. At the front, there was an Xbox button, a, power, a controller pairing button, and a USB-A port. Underneath, X, uh, Microsoft had a circular hello from Seattle plate that the, con that the console sat on, similar to what it uses on the larger Xbox Series X. The patent filed in 2022 was assigned to Chris uh, Kujawski. Kujawski, a principal designer at Microsoft. Kujawski. 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 Kujawski led the design for the Series X and S consoles. Microsoft first announced it was planning a streaming device in 2021, but eventually canceled its Keystone device because it couldn't quite get the price to around $100. Xbox chief Phil Spencer revealed uh, Keystone on his office shelf in 2022 with the official Xbox account on Twitter claiming it was an old prototype. It was more expensive than we wanted it to be when we actually built it uh, out with the hardware that we wanted inside. Spencer had said in an interview with The Verge in late 2022, we decided to focus on the team's efforts on delivering the smart TV streaming app. Which segues nicely into our next topic, which is Xbox gaming coming to Amazon Fire TV. Oh, God. At uh, Xbox, we are committed to bringing the joy and community of uh, gaming to everyone. Today, we are announcing a collaboration with Amazon where Xbox Game Pass Ultimate members in over 25 countries can play games directly from the Xbox app on select Fire TV devices via cloud gaming, um, giving people even more choice in how they play their favorite games. In July, the Xbox app will be available on the Fire TV Stick 4K Max 2023 <laughs> Uh, sixty dollars uh, U.S. and the 4K stick and the Fire TV stick 4K 2023 fifty dollars price. Uh, for people new to console gaming or for those looking for another way to play, it's a great low cost, convenient, and portable option to enjoy a huge library of incredible games. To get started, players just need a Fire TV stick, a Bluetooth enabled wireless controller, and an Xbox Game Pass Ultimate uh, membership to gain instant access to hundreds of phenomenal games, including Senua's Saga Hellblade 2, uh, Starfield, and Forza Horizon 5, among others. Plus, Bethesda Studios' beloved Fallout games are also available with Game Pass Ultimate, including Fallout 76 and Fallout 4. Fallout fans will be able to play these games on select uh, Amazon Fire TV devices alongside the acclaimed Fallout TV show, which is on Prime Video, released in April. And then so, it goes on to tell you like how to install it and whatnot. Are we expecting this app to go come to more stuff? Like, why is it only on the Fire Stick right now? Well, it's a... The app is available on Samsung TVs and monitors. Um, that was the first device that got it, was were Samsung TVs. The Fire Stick is the next device. Yeah. So this is this uh, is them slowly rolling out the the Game Pass app to other devices. What is the Samsung TV OS? Tizen? Tizen. You're yeah. Right. Yeah, there you go. I see I know. Um sure. it's Linux based. Yes. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Oh, Put that on Steam Deck. Oh! Because right now, it's playing fucking Game Pass on Steam Deck is annoying as hell. They probably aren't going to put Game Pass on Steam Deck, like, officially, officially, it, because... You know what? It doesn't matter. Just put the app on desktop mode, and then right. that's it. Yeah. That's all you need. Right now, it does some weird bullshit where you need to, like... It, like, opens up Chrome, and the home screen is Xbox... But you have to configure all the controls and shit. It's a pain in the ass. I think, I think by Xbox releasing a Game Pass app on Fire Stick is 
a great step in the right direction. However, it's been 2022 was when they made Game Pass available on Samsung TVs. And now two years later, they're rolling it out to the next device. Yeah. The rollout of Game Pass on more devices has been glacially slow. Yes. And it's not slow. a good look for the company. If that's what your plan is to put Game Pass on as many devices as possible, if in two years you only have it on two non Xbox devices. Yeah. And I can't imagine it would be difficult. Maybe the most difficult part is getting Amazon and Samsung to play along with it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I could see it being an issue with uh, Samsung if it's Linux, but I'm pretty sure. Uh, well, it's all. The Fire Stick is Android, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. 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 It's all streaming. And Chromecast. If they got it on the Fire Stick, why not the Chromecast? You know, it's just really like creating a user interface. And then all the gameplay is like beamed off to a server somewhere. Yeah. So yeah, you're literally playing a video through, yeah. through an app. So it shouldn't be, you know, it's just about creating like the the user experience yeah. for the different platforms. Also, I mean, controller latency is a huge issue. Right. That, yeah. You've got to make sure that that's going to work yeah. good. Um, when did, wait, when did it go to Samsung? Two years ago? Uh, 2022. Well, why the fuck isn't it on Steam Deck? Yeah. That's really annoying. Um, well, this is useless to me. I have a Chromecast. So, <laughs> when's it going to be on Chromecast? I have, I have like several. I mean, I don't have the 4K models, but I have like several Fire Sticks and like uh, a Fire TV with has Fire OS built into it. Oh, Fire OS sucks. It is terrible. It is so slow. Will this work on Fire OS? Well, that's what the Fire Sticks are. Yeah, but I don't think this would work on Fire OS. Uh, the Game Pass app specifically is for the Fire Stick 4K Max and the Fire Stick 4K. Okay. Yeah. Probably because it needs the lowest latency possible. Yeah. Like Stadia only worked on like the ultra like Chrome. Yeah. Case. Um, all right. Well, we kind of skipped over the Keystone patent, uh, or, 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 or whatever. Um, yeah, I mean. We see the picture of it. I just think it looks really cool. It's it's like a little chode of a Series S. Yeah. It would have been a really cool looking device. And it would have been a great entry point for Game Pass. Yeah. I mean, if it was $100, here's a little $100 box that gets you started on video games. Like, like imagine you have a friend that just wants to play Call of Duty. Well, well, they couldn't. But But now (laughs) in the future, Mm -hmm. if they just want to play Call of Duty, oh. Here's a hundred dollar little box. Yeah. It'll do it. I remember, like they said, like the big problem was like they have to include a controller. And yeah, that that's, just adds a lot of money to the. That's retail minimum fifty dollars. Yeah. So, uh, that's half the cost of the device. Yeah. So, that's that would be a major issue. They could like include like a cheap controller, but then yeah. they're really lowering the value of this thing. Yeah. I mean, then they could buy a controller. Never mind. Mm-hmm. All right. Um. Next news is I still don't have a button for this. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you picked that up on the mic, but that was boom. Gunshot. <laughs> Here we were being Backlog! 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 We're louder than the booms. Yeah. Guys, welcome to the backlog. This is part of the show where we uh, pick a random game. You do it. You do uh, it every game time. we've ever bought has been put into an Excel spreadsheet uh, throughout our entire lives. Every game for every system we've ever owned. One Excel spreadsheet. And today, we're going to pick one at random and talk about it, regardless of whether or not we've played it. What is the number that we're at? Uh, 964. Ooh. Went up one. And we are at 151, 151. like Pokemon. Like Pokemon. Uh, it is not Pokemon. It is Vector Man for the Sega oh, Genesis. okay. Yeah, baby. Often forgotten Hell yeah. Vector Man. Hell yeah, Vector Man. Some of y'all are too young oh, for man. Vector you, Man. You, you, you Zoomers and Gen Alpha are in for a treat. This is the first one? First one, yes. Okay. Which one's better? I don't know. Vector Man 2 gets no love. It doesn't. 
But it was fine. It was good. It had Vector like, Man One was more iconic and yeah, like, I think and so. Like wackier. Vector Man, Vector Man one, Two was a little ugly. <laughs> yeah. Vector Man Two reminds me a little bit of like Odd World, just the way that the the world was. was I wouldn't made. I don't know if I would give it that. Okay. You know. But here, Vector Man One, 1995 Sega Genesis. Vector oh, Man One was awesome. It was a later entry into the Sega li Genesis library, but it was a it was a banger of a game. Great music, interesting character designs, good graphics for an aging 16-bit system. Yeah, it had like this weird 3D thing going on. What, yeah. uh, there was a lot of really cool attention to details. They don't show it here, but this little beginning opening, so the second you turn the game on, you yeah. get the Sega logo, which every game had. But in this game, Vector Man's there, and you can move him around. Yeah. And there's like little Easter eggs. You can like shoot up, and then a little yeah. TV falls down. It was cool as shit. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you play the game. And yeah. the game is very hard. Yes. <laughs> there's some weird, stupid story. This is the game. Yeah. This it's is the part everybody knows. Oh, uh, epilepsy warning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this game's got a lot going on. Yeah, it's a lot of like flashing imagery. So if like if you're prone to like if you're sensitive to that stuff, maybe just skip the backlog for this. Episode. Yeah. Every time, a th so the TVs are. It's like Sonic, where the yeah. TVs have like power ups and stuff. But every time they blow up, there's just flashing lights yeah. and shit. It's a uh, it's a 2D side scrolling jump and shoot game. Uh, if you get different power ups and abilities. Uh, the cool thing about Vector Man, as you can see on screen, is he's made of like all these different balls, and he can transform into different uh, devices, like a drill or a, a train set. At one point, a helicopter. Yes. What's cool about uh, the first game, at least from my memory, is every other level is dedicated to Vector Man as a non. Oh, see here, he transformed into a bomb and just blows up everything on screen. Yeah. Every other level is dedicated to Vector Man as a non-biped uh, device. Like, here's the first level. He's he's just walking around. But then the next level, he's like a spaceship or whatnot. I don't I remember I, the order of... He immediately becomes a train after this. Yeah. Well, first of all, you have to fight a helicopter. Yes. Which, which is awesome. Yeah. Uh, then immediately after that, you're a train. Yeah. And, okay. and you're fighting this giant thing. Yeah. And uh, this is where I died every time. <laughs> yeah, uh, this was hard. Eventually, we got past it, though. Yeah. Uh, but... I don't know if I've ever beaten this game. I've definitely never beaten this game. It's really, really hard. Yeah. We went through a phase where we uh, picked up a game genie and like went through all of the games that we yeah. couldn't beat. Um, yeah, because you know, back then, you kind of had to. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely never beat this game. Yeah. Uh, I would get to about here um, at most and then uh, probably die. Yeah, and then same. And play the whole thing again. Uh, again, it is a very hard game. Yeah. Uh, you, there's like you can change the difficulty of it uh and well, oftentimes we would because we were, we were young and we were not ashamed but like even then like the the game was like pretty brutal. no it was impossible yeah uh who made this game uh f it was a first party sega published game the developer was a blue sky software okay I'm trying to see what else they made aside from the two vector man is games. this sega's answer to mega man it was sega's because it's answer jumping and shooting i mean it was Sega's answer to Donkey Kong Country. Oh, because of the graphics? Because of the graphics. Because uh, it had like those like pseudo 3D pre-rendered graphics. Yeah, like and Vector Man's made of balls and he looks like he's like rendered in 3D, but yeah. really it's just JPEGs. Which I, I guess kind of makes sense because like Donkey Kong Country was, you know, Donkey Kong's a Nintendo IAP from like the 80s and like Donkey Kong Country is very much in their wheelhouse of like, you know, family friendly 2D platformers. Vector Man is very much in the Sega Genesis wheelhouse, where it's like this cool, edgy '90s, like extreme, and he shoots kind of stuff. With yeah, handgun. So, yeah, yeah, I remember really liking this game, even though never really got far at all. Yeah, uh, it did have good music. I do remember that. Yeah, it did. It was yeah. like it was like a like a really hard techno. Yeah. <laughs> like beat. Um. So yeah, I was a big fan of this. Uh, we had a lot of Genesis games. This was yeah. one of the ones we played the most, I would yeah. say. Uh, and then we also got Vector Man 2, which yes. was probably equally as hard. Uh, felt like there was more stuff to do in it. Uh, felt a little more forgiving. Uh, there was more uh, to explore in that game. But I felt this one had more 
charm to it. Yeah, this was definitely more... I think this one had more character. Yeah, this was definitely more iconic of the two, I would say. Um, the second is, one had, like, the. it was, like... The, the the levels were it, it felt gross there was like all this like weird yeah, organic like the, stuff going the, on the graphics were like a better from like a detail perspective but like it was also like much darker it was darker and like you were in the woods yeah and there were like these weird like ugly creatures and stuff and i didn't like it and yeah. there's a lot of bugs there's yeah. a lot of bug imagery and i didn't, I, I didn't yeah. like that this is like it's like technical and robot yeah i, I kind of like it um so I would say, if you have a chance, try Vector Man. Absolutely. Is it in the Sega Classics collection? I think it is. It's on. I believe it's on the Sega Classics collection, uh, the Genesis Classics collection. It is not on Switch Online. It should be, but it's not. Now, is Vector Man 2 even playable anywhere? Uh, I believe so. Vector Man 2 was released on the Sonic Gems collection in 2005. The Sonic Ultimate Genesis Collection 2009 and the Genesis Mini 2. <laughs> okay. Not very easy to get your hands on Vector Man 2. No. Vector Man 1, you can get in the Sega Genesis uh, classic game. Yes. Not uh, the one on Nintendo Switch Online, the other one. Vector Man 1 is available on the Sonic Gems Collection, the Sega Genesis Collection from 2006, Sonic's Ultimate Genesis Collection. Uh, it's available on Steam. Um, it is part of the Sega Forever service, which I believe is on iOS. So maybe you can play oh. Vector Man on your phone for free. I will look that up right Fizz now. Fizz Widgie says one and two are 99 cents on Steam. There you go. So that'd be cool if there's a ROM in there. Yeah. Some of, the, some of these Steam ports are just a, a ROM wrapped yeah. emulator. Vector Man is not available on iOS. Lame. Damn. Hey, thanks for watching the backlog, everybody. You should watch a podcast sometime if you're yeah. not already. If you are watching the podcast, stay tuned for more podcasts. If you're not, bye. Bye. All right. Uh, next news. Where are we? Uh, we are up to Steam reveal stats on playing with the controller. Oh, I saw this. Yes. I saw a TikTok that was talking about... Uh, Apex Legends wins or, or like win rate for controller versus mouse and keyboard. Mm -hmm. And it was very apparent that the aim assist is very, uh, carries a lot in Apex <laughs> Legends. I thought that's what this was. It is not what this no. is. Uh, hello. More players than ever are choosing to play Steam games with a controller. And we thought it would be a good time to share some stats about controller usage on Steam along with an update about Steam input. So here are the stats. Since 2018, daily average controller use has tripled from 5% to up to 15% of all sessions. About 42% of these controller sessions are using a Steam input, enabling over 300 supported controllers, custom button bindings, and community configurations. And during that time, the controller landscape has changed. 59% of sessions are using Xbox controllers. 26% are using PlayStation controllers and 10% are using Steam Decks. Uh, as usage has grown, our team has continued uh, working to improve and adding features to enhance the controller experience for these players. Excuse me. Ugh. So wait, Burping. do we know what the percentage of players who are using a controller at all? It's about 15% of all of all play sessions is what they said. Daily average control users has tripled from 5% to 15% yeah. for of all sessions. Okay, so 15% of all sessions is using a controller of some kind. Yes. And of those sessions, 59% uh, of those people are using Xbox controllers. That makes a lot of yeah. sense. Um, as users has grown, our team has continued to work uh, to improve and add features to enhance the controller experience for these players. Here are some of the new features we've shipped for Steam input and controller users recently. Uh, big picture update, complete redesign of the controller first experience on Steam, bringing the Steam Deck user experience to the big screen, new controller configurator, rethought and simplified configurator to set, manage, and edit controller bindings, gyro aiming, overhauled and improved experience for controllers with gyro, implementing flick stick functionality and Steam input, virtual menus, adding support uh, to the desktop client, PlayStation controller support, 
We worked with Sony to improve support for PS controllers, including the DualSense Edge, uh, which can now su automatically uh, support future third-party licensed Sony gamepads um, and Xbox controller support. We shipped a driver for Windows, allowing us to better support Xbox One controllers, including the rear buttons of the Xbox Elite controllers. One of the benefits of Steam input is that when it's implemented in the game, players can use any of can use any one of the over 300 supported controllers to play. We also recently added support for the new Hori Pad for Steam, available in Japan late this summer, uh, and worked with Hori's team to make their controller work well with Steam input. The team is continuing to work on Steam input and controller support on Steam, and we are always looking for feedback. Let us know what you think in the forums. I'm really interested in this uh, yes. Steam Ori controller. Why would they make a controller a that's Steam labeled? <laughs> you know, like, because it's just a controller. I think <laughs> it's just a PC controller. The thing with Steam was like, remember when they did the Steam controllers, like the, when Valve made Steam controllers like years ago? Yeah. Those were designed to work for any PC game because PC games up until like relatively recently were designed for mouse and keyboard. So like trying to configure them to a button based control layout was very difficult. They made Steam controllers specifically to work around that to be very malleable to work with any type of game, regardless of input. I guess a controller dedicated for PC gaming, let alone for Steam gaming, needs to be one that's open enough and flexible enough to work with any sort of game. You know, like something like a first-person shooter that never worked with a controller or a strategy game that benefits from a mouse and keyboard over a controller. Right. But this one is just a controller. Yeah. <laughs> that's why it's like... Well, I think... Why you know, even I bother putting the Steam label on it? Controller support on PC games, like, was atrocious until the xbox 360 like that like st standardized it across the board for everyone but people yeah. just use 360 controllers and they would just use the 360 controller layout going forward um so i guess that kind of standardized things to a way that even valve was like we can use this uh to figure out how to do controller support for all games even games that never worked with i there's uh 1995 poppy in the chat said um i love for personal experience the xbox controls aren't really that great anyone agree with me and then he said i never had any issues with a playstation controller and i love dual sense uh so i've switched to dual sense for steam i gotta be honest complete opposite experience never had any problems with an xbox controller yeah I've had problems with PlayStation controllers. They're they're not as universal. Uh, they're, yeah, Xbox is it works on everything. I remember even trying to hook up like a DualShock Four because those are supposed to be pretty open and like connectable to a PC, yeah. and they're just not as good as like using an Xbox controller. Yeah, or the PC sense. I do like the DualSense controller. I do think it's a great controller, but only for like PlayStation games. I don't know if I would want to use it for like a PC game. I also just don't like uh, uh, someone else in the chat was like, ew, asymmetrical thumbsticks. Like, no, I like asymmetrical thumbsticks. I yeah. like having them offset a little bit. Uh, I like the Xbox controller a lot. And Steam has a lot of really great uh, support for controllers now. Yeah. Uh, if a game doesn't necessarily support a certain controller or control scheme, you can map it in Steam. Yeah. And that's how I've done it with yeah, a lot that's, of Yeah, that's Steam input. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's Steam input, which uh, it said... 42% of controllers are using it. Yeah. I think you might be using it without knowing that you're using it. Yeah. Like, like it just kind of happens. Mm -hmm. I ended up needing to do that for, I think, Animal Well or something. I had to use yeah. Steam input. Um, also, they said that they implemented flick stick fun functionality in Steam input. Do you know what flick stick is? I got to try flick stick. Okay. I, I'm thinking of in Smash Brothers when you flick the C stick. It's similar mm -hmm. so you know how in a first person shooter the right stick controls where you're aiming yes now imagine if instead of doing that you're always looking forward mm -hmm. and if you f and the stick is a 360 degree movement of your body so if i want to look at you i hold the stick i flick the stick to the right okay. and i'll look directly at you got it i want to look behind me i flick the stick back and i'll look behind me if i want to look forward i flick the stick forward and i look uh -huh. forward so that's flick stick okay and that sounds really cool 
Flick Stick is a video game control scheme designed for gyroscopic controllers. The Flick Stick control scheme is primarily designed for 3D shooter games uh, with the intent of bringing perceived advantages of mouse aiming into the controller while addressing shortcomings of traditional first person uh, shooter control schemes. So it sounds like you would use that to like just to the stick to just change your position while you actually aim wh yeah. at what's on screen with the gyro. Yeah. So like if I want to shoot you in the head, I would flick to you and then I, I would fix my aim with yeah. the gyro. Uh, I use gyro aiming in on the Switch with a yeah. lot of stuff. I think it helped with like Apex and oh, stuff. Oh, yeah, it helps with all, like every game. That's uh, it was really cool yeah. in Splatoon. Um, but I use it on my phone with Warzone Mobile. Okay. Running around in Warzone and fucking shooting people yeah. with a controller and then freaking adjusting my aim. Like, 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 Basically, I, I don't have flick stick on, but mm -hmm. I'm looking at somebody and then shooting them by by using motion controls. Yeah. It's almost like having a mouse. It's really cool. Uh, but I would like to try it with flick stick because yeah. that might help things. I've heard nothing but great things about flick stick, but I would imagine that it would take a lot of getting used to. Oh it. yeah. Does the Steam Deck have gyro? I it, think does. it does. It does. I don't know what supports it. You know. Yeah, uh, gyro is not universal. Yeah. So uh, sometimes it just works, mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of times it does not. Yeah, it would be great if it was because I think, especially playing like a first person game, would, like, would help tremendously. But they're saying that uh, gyro and flick stick are now part of Steam input. So yeah. you can map stuff to the gyro now. So yeah. if you want to map the whole right mouse movement, mm -hmm. you can. Do that yeah, while I gotta, gyro. I gotta want. take a look at that. It'd be cool. I haven't played with it, but it'd be cool if you can uh, map uh, gyro only when you're holding down uh, left trigger, which yeah. would be ADSing, like you're looking down the sights mm -hmm. of a gun. And if you're holding down the the ADS button, then gyro aiming is is enabled. That would mm -hmm. be cool. Um, I'm sure you could do that. The the, the Steam Deck input controls per game is like really robust yeah. and you could do a lot with it so that's cool more steam but news. it's yeah that's not all from valve because they introduced a uh, steam game recording beta a new built-in system for creating and sharing your gameplay footage uh clip it Clips or it didn't happen uh, from capturing highlights to documenting entire campaigns. There are many ways to use this all new set of features uh, with background recording mode. Your gameplay is continuously saved to your preferred drive, uh, never exceeding your specified duration or storage limits. An on demand recording mode uh, with manual start and stop is also available. Uh, replay, um, useful for things like seeing what went wrong when your hero died or recalling something mentioned at, um, by an NPC earlier, uh, accessible in the steam overlay for every game, uh, clips, uh, keep only the video that matters to you. Steam offers lightweight tools to make it easy to find and clip your gameplay footage. Uh, you have share, get your videos, uh, where you want them. One click, sh uh, share to a friend in chat or post to your post your finest moments for the world to see plus easily send footage from your steam deck to your pc or mobile device uh so yeah so they they basically implemented a gameplay recording feature there are some some games uh that work with nvidia shadow play which is yeah. nvidia's version of this uh and it will automatically clip when you kill somebody in a yeah. competitive game or when you do something cool, it'll like know when yeah. you do something cool. And it'll the clip PS5 it for you. automatically records when you get a trophy. Yeah. Okay. And that's annoying as hell. <laughs> <laughs> so this looks like it has uh, time and event markers. Yes. The, the theme timeline appears whenever you are actively recording. Oh, I guess you have to be actively recording yeah. in order for these markers to show up. Um, It'd be cool if it did some automatic stuff in certain games, uh, yeah. like in Dota or something, yeah. like a game that Steam supports. However, I will say that, uh, just like NVIDIA Shadowplay, this is basically like streaming your gameplay. Yeah. So it will impact your performance of the game. Mm -hmm. So if you are one of those people that wants the highest frame rates possible, you should probably just turn this off. Yeah. Uh, or have it set to just record a cool thing, like in Counter-Strike, I don't know, yeah. like if you want to do a kill, I don't know uh it is deck verified so you can use it on steam Deck. that's crazy. yeah that's cool 
Uh, two ways to record. You can record in background. Steam will begin recording automatically when you start playing so you don't miss those unexpected moments. You specify the hard drive space limits. Once full, oh. the oldest gameplay will be overwritten as new gameplay is recorded. You can watch, create, and save clips from these recordings. Uh, the second way to record is on demand. Steam will begin recording only after you press a hotkey. Start and stop recording manually in this mode. All recordings are automatically saved as clips. And there's other features. Uh, it works with any game. Uh, it's engineered for performance, minimizes uh, CPU usage of video encoding by using a dedicated video encoding hardware of your AMD or NVIDIA GPUs. Uh, you can access in and out of game. You can edit, share, and manage your videos using a completely redesigned recording and screenshot interface. Customizable disk usage. There's privacy uh, features uh, and more. So you can try it now. It's in beta. So it's going to be buggy, but this could be, this could be a thing. Um, it's interesting that like this valve is just now getting into game recording because this is now a two generations thing. Yeah. I mean, like dedicated built in game. It's recording not, features. it's not their thing. Yeah. It is now that they have a console. True. Now, now they need a way to share from, from the, Steam Deck because yeah. you have it on every other console, you right? Know, the, the the share button. So they were a little behind in that regard, but yeah. I mean, they again, you already have like Nvidia Shadow Play and a lot of other stuff yeah. that's already implemented on PC games. Plus, so they like, just didn't feel the, the need ease for of it. access to like an Aver Media device or an Elgato or like all these other external devices. Mm -hmm. You know, it kind of like eats into you know Valve's usage of it. You know, you know what I mean? Like, why not? Instead of going out and getting like an external device. Just use what you have. Yeah. Uh, well, on PC, you don't need an external device. You, right. get, you, you got everything. Mm -hmm. uh, all, right. all right. Next. I wanted to... You put this in here, but I wanted yes. to put it up pretty high because I think this is funny. Yeah. PlayStation's weirdest program has been mysteriously broken for longer than the 2011 PSN outage. Interesting. You remember that? <laughs> interesting title of yeah. the article. I, I forgot about that. How long was it out? It was like a month. A, whole a little month? over, little over a month, yeah. But this isn't that. PlayStation Stars is one, of, is one of Sony's most bizarre initiatives in the PlayStation 5 era. The program lets you earn coins you can use to buy games on PSN as well as collect virtual figurines that can only be viewed inside of the PlayStation app. And the whole thing has been broken since the beginning of June. Uh, you're probably wondering what the hell PlayStation Stars even is, assuming you forgot or were never aware of it to begin with. Uh, like seemingly most PlayStation players at this point, the program was an overhaul of the PlayStation Rewards that launched back in 2022. Players could get coins for buying games or completing campaigns that challenged them to play certain types of games in exchange for bespoke collectibles. Uh, these would be added to their virtual bookshelf by, uh, sorry, their virtual bookshelf that ranged from callbacks to the platform's history to branded crossovers like Spider-Man's Adidas. Still, uh, it's a nice way to earn cash back that eventually adds up. Uh, it was first started noticing issues around June 6th when PlayStation Stars uh, accessed via a small icon on the home screen of the PlayStation mobile app wouldn't open. Instead, players were greeted by an error message. PlayStation Stars is currently experiencing issues. Our engineers are aware of the issues and are working on a solution. Wait, uh, it says it's a nice way to earn cash back. They, they, they don't mean... You cash. earn points to... It's like the gold coins on Switch. Yeah, but you get, like, garbage. You get, like, just some weird virtual items that you can only see in the PlayStation Stars app. Well, th that's, like, the main focus. You yeah. also get, like, pocket change that you can put towards a game. Like the oh. gold coins on Switch. Like the gold coins on Switch. Yes. I'm confused because there's gold coins and there's silver yeah. coins. Yes. The silver coins are the dumb ones. Yes. Okay, and the gold yeah. ones give you money off. Exactly. Yes. Okay, so this can actually potentially get you money off of a game? Yeah, but I think the thing is, like, you earn so little per game yeah. that, like, the focus was, like, all the stupid JPEGs and stuff. This you... was very clearly, when they were announcing this, it was very clearly supposed to be NFTs. Yes. And they got rid of the NFT stuff because they realized nobody likes NFTs and mm -hmm. it would look really bad for them to have an NFT app. Right. So they got rid of the NFT stuff. And then it just became useless. It yeah. just became a useless app. <laughs> so useless that nobody realized it was down for a month. Yeah. 
Uh, the timing was especially odd since Sony was running a bunch of PlayStation Stars promotions alongside its mid-year Play Days sales event. Uh, this meant there were uh, certain collectibles and awards that could only be earned by purchasing and playing certain games during this event. According to PlayStation support, users could continue to accrue points and collectibles even while the program was down, though they wouldn't be able to see any of it, let alone track what was still incompatible. 25 days later, the program is still broken, as users on the PlayStation Stars subreddit have been uh, predicating that puts it beyond the 23-day outage that the PSN infamously suffered back in 2011 following an unprecedented hack. During that period, PlayStation 3 players were unable to play games online, buy them digitally, or use any of the console's social features. Once services were restored, Sony apologized by giving players free games and a month of PlayStation Plus on uh, on the house. I remember that we yeah. were uh, well. I was an Xbox. Yeah, we were Xbox guys. We had a PS3, but like we were Xbox. Kids. We played. I don't. I didn't have a PlayStation. Uh, I don't know if I paid for a PlayStation account. No. No, they didn't make like the pay, the PlayStation account. The PlayStation account was free. Oh, okay. Then they introduced PlayStation Plus, which just gave you like little bonuses here and there. On the PS4, that's when they made PlayStation Plus like important with you know multiplayer requirements right. and the free games and stuff. I think we, I had Xbox Live, which yeah. cost money, mm -hmm. and uh, I think the argument was like, oh well, look, PlayStation service is bad because they could just shut it down for 23 yeah. days. This would never happen on Xbox because I pay for it. <laughs> well, it's not in the keep, but you, since you brought it up. Xbox services are down right now. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, like it was late breaking news. Like the keep was already like the the show notes were already set up, but like apparently like Xbox is just down right now. It's been down all day. <laughs> Xbox Live goes down in nearly seven hour outage. So yeah, it doesn't matter which service you get. Microsoft it said it suck. resolved the technical problems that had knocked out Xbox Live for nearly seven hours. Users should no longer be encountering issues signing into the Xbox Live servers. Well, so there you go. They should. It should. Just I didn't be notice. Free. I was touching grass today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> PlayStation Stars wasn't hacked. It doesn't cost money, and it's uh, used by far fewer people. So this outage is. Hardly a scandal. Uh, it's just very strange. And Sony hasn't yet clarified what exactly the problem is. Um, there is an update, though. Uh, just as mysteriously as it went down, uh, PlayStation Stars uh, will be returning soon in a phased regional rollouts, according to an update on the PlayStation website. Thank you for your patience, and we look forward to welcoming you back. It's still not clear why the service went down in the first place or what Sony was finally able to fix. Time to see if everyone's rewards and collectibles are, um, are where they left them and if Sony... If PlayStation Stars is issuing any make goods to commemorate the occasion, probably not. Probably not. They're probably just going to shut the whole thing down. It's, it's not such, worth it for them to try to fix it. It's such a weird program. I didn't know you can get money. Me neither. That I would have been using it. Yeah. You know? Like, I signed up for it when it first came out just to see what the hell it was. And you literally get, like, dumb little 3D renderings of, like, dumb things. Yeah. That's, <laughs> it's a very dumb that's program. Dumb, but yeah. if they said, like, hey, you could get you know, $5 towards a yeah. game, then yeah, I would friggin' play it. Uh, all right. Next news. Uh, let's talk about iOS ports of Resi 4. I haven't seen it written out like that. Yeah. Assassin's Creed Mirage and Death Stranding sold poorly, estimates suggest. Yeah. I would like to jump in and say I played the Resident Evil 8 uh, port yeah. yesterday. Okay. Uh, it ran bad. I don't really? know what I, it, I played it before. Yeah, and it ran great. Mm -hmm. And I was playing it yesterday, and suddenly it was bad. Really it was choppy and shit. I don't. I mean, I'm on the iOS 18 beta. Right. Maybe that's so why. that could have yeah. something to do with it. But iOS 18 beta has game mode. Right. Did you turn on game mode? It's then? on. I I tried to turn on game mm -hmm. mode. It is just on automatically when you play a game. Okay. So, and everything I read about game mode just says that it increases the, uh, or it lowers the latency for Bluetooth connection. Okay. I don't know if it necessarily like makes the, oh, and, and, and it lowers uh, uh, processing power for background apps, I think, right. which is the more important thing uh -huh. that matters to me. Um, 
But yeah, it ran bad. I don't know. I'm going to try it again. Yeah. Uh, maybe it was just that day my right. my phone felt like not working too good. But uh, usually all this stuff runs great. I yeah. was surprised that uh, it, it just randomly all of a sudden decided not to run good. Uh, according to analysis by uh, MobileGamer.biz, based on the estimates of app figures, uh, the iOS ports of Resident Evil 4, Resident Evil Village, Death Stranding, and Assassin's Creed Mirage have failed to sell well despite Apple featuring them during their keynote presentations in the past year. The games are only playable on high-end iPhone and iPad devices, meaning the potential audience size is smaller than the overall iPhone user base in the first instance. However, even with this in mind, app figures estimates uh, suggest that while Assassin's Creed Mirage has been downloaded around 123,000 times, it's only made about $138,000 of gross revenue. What? Given that the game is free to download with players able to access a small part of the game before having to pay $50 to unlock the rest of it, it this suggests that fewer than 3,000 people went to buy the full game. I'll say that uh, Resident Evil 8 is the same idea. Yeah. And I still have not gotten to the part where I need to buy the game. <laughs> I'm like, I got... Yeah. pretty decently into the game right you get a pretty big chunk to try the game really? and i think that that's really important for yeah. for something like this if you're playing a port of a game on hardware that it might not run good on yeah you need to be able to try it and you yeah. need to be able to try a significant portion of it mm -hmm. so you can get to actual gameplay because the beginning of a game usually is just some bullshit yeah you need to wait till the game opens up and be able to play that for a little mm -hmm. bit in order to see if you can even run it on your iPhone or on even your computer or something. Yeah. Uh, similar circumstances, similar calculations based on app figures estimates suggest that around 7,000 iOS users have paid for Resident Evil 4, around 5,750 have uh, paid for Resident Evil Village, and around 10,000 have paid for Death Stranding. That's crazy. MobileGamer.biz also points out that these are merely estimates and notes that another data firm, AppMagic, uh, has higher figures, albeit still low in the grand scheme of things. According to AppMagic, Resident Evil 4 and Village have sold uh, 15,000 and 34,000 copies, respectively, on iOS, while Assassin's Creed Mirage has sold 5,750 and Death Stranding has sold around 23,000. Uh, so yeah, it's still not a lot. That's it's like a drop in the bucket compared to what these games sell on like console. It's really disappointing. Yeah, we know that developers don't like to uh, develop for Apple devices. Yeah, because it just doesn't seem worth it to them. And this is just proof that it's not worth it. To yeah. Them. I have a lot of faith that these new iPhones uh, are capable of a lot especially these days where games are being developed in a way where they can run great on worse hardware. Yeah. Uh, just with, you know, lighting pared down and stuff. Yeah. But like, who gives a shit about light? Like, I'll, I'll, I'll understand that the lighting is going to be worse on my phone than yeah. it would be if I was playing on an Xbox. Um, but I was hoping that this would give other developers incentive to port stuff over to iOS or to the phone because everyone's got a phone. Yeah. It's just, I would love games to be in more places. But I think in this article touches upon it too. I think the problem is that, you know, these are $50 high end console games that they're now porting over to the phone. Whereas that gaming market is used to, free yeah. up to like three dollar games that you just play in like quick bursts not necessarily like the full-fledged like console gaming experience and that combined with the fact that they're only available on like the highest end iphones not necessarily like i can't play them because i have an iphone 11 yeah so i they're completely out of my reach so uh, th we saw this issue uh, arise or this conversation happened when Nintendo did Mario Run. Mm -hmm. uh, they That was a free app. Yeah. You play the first level and then you have to pay 10 bucks. Yes. 10 bucks, not a lot of money no. for a game, but kind of a lot of money for a mobile game, yes. especially one that you might have thought was free. Yeah. So I think they did really good for themselves with Mario Run because it was yeah. very popular. But I don't think they did as well as they would have liked to, or else we would have seen a lot more yeah. 
exactly of that payment 100 percent uh and this is the worst end of the spectrum this yeah. is a free game that is all of a sudden 50 dollars. yeah i want this to catch on because i would love an ecosystem where i can play assassin's creed mirage on my phone or on my macbook yeah 50 dollars for that it would be great. It's like having a Switch. I think what Apple needs to do, though, is I think they need to focus more on making the M processor MacBooks and Mac computers more gamer-friendly and have those be the devices you play the modern AAA game stuff on because that makes more sense to people to pay $50 to play a modern game on a computer than it does to play fifty pay $50 to play a modern game on a phone. So Because those are... It's been shown that those are two completely different markets. My understanding is that some of these games, if you buy it on the phone, it will also be on the App Store on your computer. Yes. But not all of them. Right. And I don't understand why it's like that. Yeah. Uh, that's a big problem. So maybe we should be looking at these numbers differently. Maybe it's uh, how many people bought it for the Mac yeah. and then are also playing it on the phone. You know, like that's yeah. a number that we could look at too. But I'd imagine that'd be pretty small too because people just aren't gaming on their Macs. Yeah. Apple did do some great stuff with uh, their emulation. What do they call it? The, 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 oh, they, there was that thing that Rosetta? Made, no, well, yes, but no, there was one specifically for gaming. Metal. Yeah, but it's a it's a it's an engine that oh, emulates. Oh yes, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah it emulates. And it's the whole reason yeah. why all of this shit exists. Yeah. People were doing cyberpunk on. Yes, on, yes, uh, I do M1 remember. Mac. Game porting toolkit. Thank yes. you, original Spiff. Uh, that apparently is awesome. Yeah. Uh, and if I knew how to use it, you know, I'd be porting fucking everything. Mm -hmm. Um, th it would be great if that was made into something that was a little more user friendly that people yeah. could mess around with. Uh, yeah, Resident Evil Four. Get. Uh, I can just get it right now. It includes in-app purchases. The game is sixty dollars, plus the separate ways DLC, which is ten dollars. Jesus yeah. Christ! I paid for one of them, and I don't remember which one it was. I either paid for Resident Evil Four or I paid for Resident Evil Village. I'm trying to see. And I don't remember which one I paid for because I got both of them. Yeah. And I played both of them, but I didn't play that much of either of them. The the App Store on here doesn't set compatibility. Works with this MacBook. Oh, compatibility works with this MacBook. Uh, Mac requires a uh, Mac OS 13 or later on a Mac with an M1 chip or later. iPhone requires iOS 17 on an iPhone 15 Pro or 15 Pro Max. So it lists the compatibility of every Apple device it works on on the store page. I mean, I guess that it implies. That like once you get it and you get it for everything, but I think they need a they need to spell it out more clearly. So I I I I guess I could show this. Um you got Resident Evil 7 Biohazard, Resident Evil 4, mm -hmm. Resident Evil Village for Mac. Okay. So that is oh, here probably we go. different than the phone. Go phone. to Resident Evil 4. Just click on it. It's uh, a cloud. That means I had it on my phone. I've never yeah. downloaded it on my Scroll computer. Scroll down a little bit. It's under the first picture. It's uh, I see Mac, iPhone, and uh, there. That's where it is. That's what I was looking for. Because on and this is only Mac. Yes. So it's the phone version is different. That sucks. Yes. Dude. <laughs> that sucks. But it's cool that Resident Evil Four. I can just download it. And I could probably just pick it up where I left off. Yes. So that's cool. I want that, but for Resident Evil Village, because Village is the one that's more graphically intensive. Yeah. That's one of the problems with, yeah. uh, with gaming on Mac. I would love it to be more universal. Yeah. Now, Death Stranding. You know what? I got it for Steam. I'm not buying it again. Yeah. <laughs> not doing that again. Because I already got it on PlayStation. I think I it was on sale on Steam, so I just ended up buying it. Right. Uh, and I got to replay it on Steam. Uh, I'm not buying it on my freaking phone. Yeah. All right. Uh, oh, we got a super chat. Oh. Braden. Seven uh, loonies. 
Bob, my RG35XX turns off as soon as I power it on. Do you know any fixes? P.S. Hey, Will. Hey. It's tech support time. <laughs> I should have a tech support time button. There you go. Uh, use a different cable to charge it. <laughs> Simple. That literally, that's the main, the, the most common issue that has that effect is right. use a different cable or, or charger. Uh, it needs a USB... C to USB A cable and a really dumb one. Uh, and same thing with the charger. All right. Uh, next news. We got a lot. So yeah. Let's through this shit. Okay. Uh, Multiple we... Assassin's Creed remakes on the way. Yay. Uh, I love what remakes. Everybody, I love what Assassin's everybody Creed was games. asking for. In an interview on the Ubisoft website, uh, CEO Yves Gilmo was asked uh, what Assassin's Creed players can expect from the series in the future. Gilmo replied that the series would see a variety of games in the coming years, including numerous remakes. Firstly, Hold on, pause. Retro Game Core's in the chat. He's, hey. He says the issue is the SD card. There you go. So make sure that, pop that out, pop back in. Make sure it's got all the right shit on it. Okay. Try all that stuff. All right. Gilmo said, uh, firstly, players can expect... Players can be excited about some remakes, which allows us to revisit some of the games we've created in the past and modernize them. Uh, there are worlds and some of our older Assassin's Creed games that are still in, uh, extremely rich. Secondly, to answer your question, there will be plenty of experience variety. The goal is to have Assassin's Creed games come out more regularly, but yeah! not for it to ha be the same experience every year. Uh, there are a <laughs> lot of good things to come, uh, including Assassin's Creed Hex, which uh, we've announced uh, which is going to be very different from Assassin's Creed Shadows. We are going to surprise people, I think. Uh, report last year claims that Ubisoft is uh, started development on a remake of the popular, except with this, these two guys, the popular <laughs> Assassin's Creed entry, Black Flag. Kotaku sources state huh? that a remake of the 2013 cross-gen PS3 and 360 game was in the early stages and will not be complete uh, at least for a few years. While Ubisoft has never remade a previous Assassin's Creed game, it has released numerous remasters in the past. The Ezio Collection was released in 2016, offering remastered versions of Assassin's Creed 2, Brotherhood, and Revelations. This was followed by the 2018 remaster of Assassin's Creed Rogue. I don't remember them remaking Assassin's Creed Rogue. It was more of like a like an upscaled version for like the modern hardware. I heard Rogue was really good, just not a lot of people played it because it was for the previous generation yes. console. Yeah. Uh and yeah, Black Flag is like the last one I would expect to remake Yeah. For. <sighs> These aren't games that like you need to like fully remake. These are games that you just have available for purchase. They you know? literally just want to pad the 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 library. They they yeah. just they have said that they don't want to release one every year. They they want to like relax a little bit, which yeah. they definitely should. But instead, they're like, we're going to relax, but we'll give you some bullshit in the meantime. Yeah. And this is the bullshit. They got to stop. You I know, saw on Reddit, uh, somebody uh, had uh, like all of the Assassin's Creed games in their Steam library, and they yeah. all updated at, at once. Yeah. And then I got to see how many Assassin's Creed games were on Steam, and it's so many. Yeah. There's ones you didn't even know about. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Um, I don't know. Yeah. It's it's weird because like they started slowing down, and then they ramped up again. Yeah, and now we're back to like where we were before Odyssey came, the Origins came out. You know, we're they're oversaturating the Assassin's Creed market again. And why the games get worse when you do that? Yeah, I was excited for uh, Shadows. Yeah. Uh, but the reason I was excited for Shadows is because I thought they were like doing something different. They were taking uh like like they took a little bit of a break, um, but not really. Yeah, no, they're they're still doing too much. Imagine if like EA was like, we're gonna remake some of our classic Madden games. Because it's kind of the same thing, you know. Like it's it's an annualized franchise. You know the the point is not to, you know completely redo it but like if you want to go back and play like an older one because you like the features of the older one better have that available and play that mm -hmm. you know it, it's not the type of thing where like you know i don't need a fully rendered 3d version of madden 1995 i'm perfectly fine with the new one that comes out so 
of note here, uh, Assassin's Creed Mirage is not on the App Store for the Mac. Interesting. Assassin's Creed Shadows is available for pre-order. Interesting. So that's upset. Once again, these developers don't know how to handle this ecosystem. I think Mac doesn't know how to handle the gaming ecosystem. I think that that's what it is. I think you're right. I think it's both. Uh, next news: Amazon Games. Speaking of not knowing how to handle the games ecosystem, uh, Amazon Games VP uh, Christopher Hartman spoke with Variety about the retail giant's goals for the medium of video games, which effectively boil down to being the reverse of Netflix, where Netflix is taking its steps into gaming with mobile titles. Amazon is diving first into the PC and console market. Uh, it's just much more. It's just much more opportunities for the market to be on the PC market, on the console market, Hartman said. Not only does it best fit his past tenure at uh, 2K and Rockstar, he offered that PC and console players take those titles more seriously than the mobile crowd. If the company would say, if if the company would say, Christopher, let's do a mobile game, I would have to hire someone, he continued. But I still believe it really, really is about the AAA games because otherwise it's a very hard market to get into. Hartman ultimately wants Amazon Games to be one of the best publishers out there, which may involve making original games and ones based on Prime Video shows. Uh, while he wants to avoid being overly reliant on big franchises, he acknowledged potential transmedia opportunities with series like Tomb Raider and Spider-Man, both of which have shows in production for Prime Video. It does not need to be always. It, uh, it does not need to be always that everything is mingled together. But it's really one brand, he noted. It's a big part of transmedia for us. Obviously, we want to work uh, much closer together. And we'll be working much closer together with different entertainment uh, areas Amazon has. Another part of Amazon game strategy, keeping things in-house rather than buying third-party developers like Netflix has done. Hartman uh, revealed that the publisher is expanding heavily with its internal studios in Montreal. uh, Buka... Boca Raton, Florida. Bucharest uh, and other locations. Uh, I know what that city is. I just never saw it spelled like that. So I don't know how to pronounce it properly. I'm sorry if you're completely. from there. Uh, he reiterated that Amazon is a very, very committed to a game uh, to be a game publisher. And to any developer out there, Harmon said that the publisher is looking for a lot of talent to grow internally. Variety's full interview with Harmon, which also includes his outlook on AI and Amazon Games' current lack of game releases, uh, can be read. Uh, f- yeah. Can anybody in the chat and in playing here in the studio, uh, can you name a game that Amazon has published? <laughs> oh, God, yes. Yeah, you can. I can. You can name one. What I exactly? I can't. It's that, it was that freaking medieval game. Yeah, exactly. Playing. It was like that's it. Like, that's like the one. Yeah, and, and that was PC. That's PC. Yeah. But like, what have they done since then? What have they put out? They're such a weird like game studio because they put out this one mild successful game, and now they're, they're <laughs> well, like, the whole chat just said New World, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, name another. Um, Amazon's very bad at running their own companies. Yeah. Every every little, everything that they have that is not the main product, which is just being a a, a shipper, yeah. a big conglomerate, uh, a, a worldwide Walmart, uh, yeah. everything that they have other than that is trash. Yes. And and they don't give them any resources to grow or make themselves yeah. better. So it's, and the, it's... and the o- the only reason I'm saying that is because I hate Twitch so much. <laughs> the Twitch product has been trash yeah. for years. Well, let us not forget what they did to my boy Comicsology. How like they yeah. basically like crippled that. They literally bought it and then and then fucking ruined, ripped it, it in yeah. half for no reason other than I guess competition. They it, comicsology was a competition for them. They integrated so they just, it into the Amazon Kindle ecosystem, and then they just broke it and forced it to work on Kindle, even though Kindle was never designed for comics. Mm-hmm. 
So that's and guess who's the asshole who's still subscribed to however many comics on that service? But it's not like they needed the technology or anything. No, they had the technology. They just needed the what the publishers that they had. Yeah, and uh, I mean they didn't even need that. They could have just negotiated. Yeah, with the no, they didn't. DC Comics was on Kindle before it was on Comics. They literally just did that to get rid of them. Yeah, yeah, that's what they do. It's I don't know. I know. So so. Amazon does use Twitch's uh, video player for like yeah. everything, but yeah. like it's a horrible video player. Yeah, it's th- there has been so many advances in video uh, web technology yeah. since Twitch started, and Twitch has not budged. Yeah, they're starting to now do betas with uh, uh, 1440p mm-hmm. and AV1 encoding and stuff, but it is nowhere close to where it should be. Yeah. Uh, I know that Amazon is like currently the publisher of the next Crystal Dynamics Tomb Raider game. Okay. Which I don't know how the hell that's going to go. I hope it goes good. I would like to see a new Tomb Raider game. Uh, I just don't have any faith in Amazon's ability to make games. Back when New World like first came out, like there was an article about like Amazon wanting to break into games. And Amazon, you know, Amazon's run like a tech company where like, Everything has to be done a certain way, whereas video game companies, like, they have to be more flexible and free form in order to, like, make things work properly because it's art. You have to be flexible in order to make art. And Amazon, like all tech companies, don't know what that means. Right. You know, just just put the square heard, peg in the round hole. I heard free-to-play games with a lot of microtransactions. They're making a lot of money. Do one of those. Yeah. Make your, yeah. Make your Assassin's Creed game one of those. All right, next new Star Wars Bounty Hunter is getting a remaster. Yay. Yay. Uh, this game? I saw this. Like, I saw a trailer for this somewhere, and I was like, oh, yeah, that game. Yeah. A Star Wars Bounty Hunter originally released in 2002 for the PlayStation 2 and GameCube. was finally coming to PC. Um, it's also coming to modern consoles, PS5, Xbox Series. Um, Aspire Media announced today that ah! it was co- an updated <laughs> version of the game. is set to arrive August 1st. Uh, I was the, just wondering who is developing. Yeah, it. not the good guys. Uh, the game uh, was also the year of attack. The game came out in the same year as Attack of the Clones, a film that made uh, an instant Star Wars star out of Jango Fett, the father to Boba Fett, and the prime clone of the Galactic Army of the Republic. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's it's just it's a prequel to Attack of the Clones where you play as Jango Fett and you learn why he was chosen to be uh, the the main guy that all the clones are based on. It's sad because. Aspire was making great ports. Yeah. And then something happened. They had a string of bad ports. Yeah, they had a string of bad ports. So wait for this one to come out before you buy it. Yes. Who knows uh, what's going to happen. I remember this being like a pretty popular game at the time because, you know, it was the closest we had gotten to being play- being able to play as Boba Fett. You can use the jetpack. You can actually accept bounties on your missions yeah. and like do that as like a side quest and stuff. So I would love to like play this game and like see how it ha- holds up and, you know, 2024 but it's aspire media so i gotta sit and wait for reviews to come out and see what the patches are button smasher in the chat says i thought that game was bad (laughs) so it has a 65 on metacritic okay playstation 2 version uh which is bad yeah but people i know who played it liked it because it's one of those things where uh the game might be bad but you get to play as Django. yeah that's cool (laughs) same thing with like enter the matrix as a game not great but you're in the Matrix, and it's pretty fucking cool. <laughs> so, Jay, have you seen that meme going around where it's like every every guy has that one PS2 game that they're de- deathly in love with, or something like that? And it's true. Yeah, every every guy has that one PS2 game where like only you like, and like nobody else, but like you love that game so much. You know what I'm mad about? Uh, I frequently when I'm testing uh, PlayStation 2 emulation, yeah. I use Burnout Revenge. Yes. Uh, because you can get right into the game, and I like that game, and it's a racing game, so you can tell, and there's good music, yeah. so you can tell how uh, the the speeds of the emulation. In Smiling Friends, they referenced <laughs> Burnout Revenge. They're like, do you want to come over and smoke weed and play Burnout Revenge with me? Or something like that. And now when I mention Burnout Revenge, that's all anybody says. See, is that where that comes from? Because that's I see that on Twitter all the time. This is burnout like come over like drink Pepsi and play Burnout Revenge. Yeah, yes. Okay. Yes. Should I watch Smiling Friends? Because like, it is my, very good. My, the, like the, I see clips of it and it does look funny. I've only and, seen the first episode, 
It but looks it, like classic Adult Swim shit. I've only seen the first episode, but I know Psychic Pebble stuff, and yeah. it is it is very funny. Okay, all right. But it's like dumb. It's like yeah, no, yeah. like look, it's basically Rick and Morty, but today we grew up on Aqua Teen Hunger Force and Sea Lab Twenty Twenty One. Like I know Adult Swim like weird comedies. And it stuff. is. It is. I can handle that. It's it, so. it's very good though. I like okay. it. Uh, but they ruined Burnout Revenge. Yeah. Me. Now I can't okay. fucking talk about it without somebody do that. <laughs> but Burnout Revenge. Great game. Yes. A little different. That one's probably rated pretty well. Yeah. Star Wars Bounty Hunter, only good because you're playing <laughs> yeah. as Boba Fett. Uh, f- yeah. So there you go. It's coming out. Uh, wait for the reviews. See what Aspire does. Or don't play it because it's lore breaking. <laughs> uh, more Star Wars. Uh, original. No, this is not Star this Wars. This is not Star Wars. This is the Resident Evil. The original three Resident Evil games are coming to GOG DRM free. Did we not talk about this? No, we did not talk about this. Oh, this sounds familiar. No, this is the breaking news from last oh. week. Uh, last week, Capcom made a shocking announcement that it was bringing back Marvel vs. Capcom. Uh, and it has recently announced that on June 26th, uh, that the digital distribution platform GOG declared that it is working with Capcom to bring the original Resident Evil trilogy to the service. The first game, Resident Evil, is available right now, while Resident Evil 2 and 3, Nemesis, will be coming to GOG at a later date. The original Resident Evil trilogy was ported to Windows PC back in the late 90s and early 2000s, but these old versions are incompatible with modern PCs, and Capcom has never ported them to Steam. So if people want to play the original Resident Evil games on PC, they would have to emulate them via ROMs. Uh, so GOG and their ongoing mission to preserve and protect classic games from uh, becoming lost media has decided to fill in and re-release the PC editions of these games. Uh, these GOG re-releases of Resident Evil, Resident Evil 2, and Resident Evil 3 Nemesis will be DRM-free and include quality of life improvements and updated compatibility with modern PC hardware. In addition, GOG's re-release of Resident Evil 1 is the uncut edition, which features more cutscenes of extreme violence and gore than the original PlayStation 1 release back in 1996. So, these are not remakes. These are not remasters. These are the games as they were released back in the 90s, just with minor tweaks to make it more playable on modern hardware. Two podcasts ago, this was rumored. We talked about this as a rumor. Okay. That's why it sounds familiar. Yes. Now it is official. It's official. I think that story, now that I'm remembering it, it was just the first Resident Evil game. This is also Resident Evil 2 and Resident Evil 3. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. So that's cool. That's exciting. No, we that, like we that's like stuff like we want to see. I'm not gonna buy it. No, but, but we like to see the availability of games like that. Yes. Last news: Crazy Taxi. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> load. Uh, New Crazy Taxi title will be an open world, massively multiplayer AAA game. Wait, what the yeah. fuck? Sega recently announced it was recruiting development staff for a new Crazy Taxi title, posting in the case that the sequel will be a large-scale, open-world, massively multiplayer game. A video interview with the game's development team reveals further details. Back in December of last year, Sega announced that it was working on new titles for five of their IP, including the Crazy Taxi franchise. The Crazy Taxi series as players assume the role of a crazy taxi driver, taking passengers to their destinations in the fastest time possible and earning tips uh, by performing dangerous stunts. The High Adrenaline series will be getting its first mainline entry since Crazy Taxi 3 High Roller in from 2002. I don't even remember that one. Uh, I... Uh, friend of mine actually had it for the original xbox you play it it was in lost set in las vegas oh okay so our dad would like it uh the developer interview published july 1st uh series producer kenji kano remarks that the upcoming game is being developed as a completely new crazy taxi that can be played by many players at once the team is currently resolving the specifics and testing the game's compatibility with multiplayer play Their goal is to maintain the Crazy Taxi style while implementing new mechanics. Apart from a realistic city environment, the developer mentions working with a theme park-like map and motifs inspired by the U.S. West Coast. So, I'm actually really happy that they're doing something a little different with it. Yes. Thinking about it, Crazy Taxi would be cool if you can see other players doing the same thing as you. Not necessarily... You don't necessarily have to be able to interact with them yeah. or, or have them interfere with your gameplay, but like 
imagine you load up a server and you're yeah. with like 30 other dudes and you see them ya 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 all yeah. over the place that'd be cool it could be interesting like you see uh you know a potential customer you like you try to drive up to get them but somebody else like beat you to it that could happen so, like, yeah yeah so like you're you know, and then like, you get competitive yeah i think there is potential in a like massively multiplayer version of crazy taxi hmm. i don't think that's a bad idea inherently I just am a little disappointed because, you know, Crazy Taxi was a single player game, an offline single player game. And I would have loved to have seen a version of that in the year of our Lord 2024. Well, they haven't said that it won't be able to run offline. Right. But if the game is being designed to be yeah. primarily online, that doesn't leave me with a lot of hope that it's going to have a good offline mode. You'll probably miss some of the cool functionality if it works like the way you yeah. just said. Um, I'm taking massively multiplayer with a grain of salt because I don't. I, I think that developers, especially Japanese developers, use that very broadly. Yeah, very broad. They could. It could mean a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Um, Willow in the chest says, "Wow, you're making it sound like you'd love Souls games." Willow, you gotta you gotta get out more. Yeah, <laughs> you you've been playing. Elden Ring way too much. Play another game. Yeah. <laughs> wow, this game uses the A button to slash. Must be like a Souls game. <laughs> uh, boss baby vibes. Boss baby <laughs> vibes. That's it's giving me boss baby vibes. All right. Um, I'm excited for this crazy tech game. I, I hope I, it's good. Yeah. I want them to do something different with the games, but yeah. have uh, but make it feel. Uh, uh, it has to feel uh familiar, but do something yes. different so that it's more modern. You yes. can't just take Jack Ryan Radio or Crazy Taxi mm -hmm. and and just make it new. You have yeah. to do shit. Add to more it. to it. Yeah, yeah, and that's something Sega has really, really, really struggled with. Yeah. All right. Uh, that's all of the news. Yes. Uh, I don't have a tweet of the week. Oh I no! Pulled one. Oh wait, I had. This isn't a tweet of the week, but somebody tweeted Elden Ring DLC too difficult. I would like to introduce you to Ninja Gaiden. <laughs> That's good. Play that on the hardest difficulty. Yeah. You will never be the same again. And I did. And fucking that first boss, impossible. Yeah. It's the 3D Ninja Gaiden. Yeah. Not, not the old one. Oh, I got one. Okay. Oh, let me copy it. I'll put it in the key. Tweet of the week! Tweet of the week! Tweet of the week! All right, there we go. Okay. This is from Mike Bong, or Weird Bongs. And it is uh, Princess Peach from the beginning of Super Mario 64. It says, I fucked up big this time. <laughs> I owe a lot of money. Bad people. I owe, a lot of ba I owe a lot of bad people money I don't have. Please, Mario. They are going to kill Toad. Peach. <laughs> Imagine if the game actually started like that. <laughs> Rob Hackett. Yeah, there you go. Rob Hackett, make it do it. All right. Uh, now we'll talk to you guys. Yes, quick. let's start with people who left comments on last week's Wolf Den Podcast over on the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Wolf Den Podcast. We got Rock Tendo who says, Hey, Will, I'm just starting to get into comic books, specifically Spider-Man. Is there a certain run I should start with? And would I have to start with the first issue in that series? You never, it's with modern American superhero comics, you never have to start at issue one because that means going back to like before you were born and reading comics that are written in a very particular way that is hard for modern audiences to get wrap their head around. Spider-Man is a difficult character because most of his best stories are the older stories. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily say don't read those. But if you want to get into more modern stuff, it's a lot of up and downs. Because J. Michael Straczynski had a great run until he didn't. Dan Slott had a great run until he didn't. Nick Spencer had a great run until he didn't. Apparently, the current Zeb Wells run is very bad, even though Zeb Wells is a great writer. Um, I would say find one that you that's recent that you're interested in. Yeah. There's really nothing. That's, you could, and you just got to jump in. I mean, yeah. obviously, try to start from the from the beginning of the, would you call it a run? 
like the graphic novel. Yeah, like, like try to find the latest graphic novel. Yeah, and just start read that. there. That and you're go interested, for, yeah. in it, Bo. You got to be interested in it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Spider Man's a tough one because it's it's a roller coaster ride. If you're interested, Spider Man. I love Spider Man. It's the comics are rough. <laughs> Check if you need something modern. Chip Zdarsky's Spectacular Spider Man was very good. So that will give you a good old fashioned Spider Man experience. Um, and also check out his uh, Chip Zdarsky's miniseries uh, Life Story, which basically is like what happened to Peter Parker H in real time from the sixties to now. Ooh. So that's that's a trip. Alberto Jaramillo says, I think Virtual Console is better because you own the games after a one-time purchase. I'm not interested in all of the games they add onto the service. I don't feel like it warrants a monthly subscription for all these old games. If Nintendo Switch Online let me buy the games individually, let me download the games onto the Switch, I would like it more. Virtual Console for me is still better because it was identical to owning the game Unlike renting it every month. I wouldn't say it's identical to owning it, but it's very close. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's the argument. That's the argument that we talked about in the episode. Yeah. Um, yeah, like we said last time, there was there's pros and cons to both methods. I think having both available would be the ideal situation. I think one of the reasons that I didn't talk about that I like Nintendo Switch Online so much is because I would pay for that if there were no classic games. Yeah. Because I want to play... Smash Brothers Online and, stuff yeah. and Mario Maker Online. Mm -hmm. So I would pay for the service just to play online, just like I do with Xbox. Mm -hmm. But it's cheaper than Xbox. Yeah. And I also get all of these games. So yeah. that's, I guess, one of the other reasons why I like it so much. Noggin Dude says, just here so the wolves don't get fined. Thank you. Thank you. Caleb Fox says, started watching Batman 89 on an international flight, and it felt like it was made for half awake situations like that. Hope to finish it on the flight back. The movie? Yeah. Oh, okay. I mean, that makes more sense. Cause, like, Batman 89 is, like, visually interesting. There's always, like, something cool to look at. It's and it's wacky. An, and it's an action movie. So, like... Yeah. You know, story and plot aren't really as important. Like, you can just focus on the moment-to-moment aspects of it you know oppenheimer is like a three hour <laughs> dialogue heavy movie where like the story is like critically they just important. don't shut up it's yeah, just it's like that's something like you want to focus on i saw dune part two over the weekend had to see it over two nights that's a three hour movie half of the movie is spoken in a made-up foreign language <laughs> multiple made-up foreign languages so that like even though that is like one of the most beautiful movies i've ever seen and like there's always something to look at and the action scenes are incredible that's a movie you don't want to watch on a plane because you want to pay attention to what they're saying also it's very pretty it is very pretty yeah um what was i gonna say batman 89 i like batman 89 uh batman returns uh I used to love Batman Returns, tried watching it uh, as an adult, and it is not as great. It is, it is, <laughs> I it think is it a, is significantly worse than Batman It's 89, a wacky one. But it's, it's still fun because of how weird it is. Yeah. It but, still has, like, something there. Yeah, but the, don't expect to, like, follow a plot or anything. Yeah, no. <laughs> Batman 89 is definitely Batman 89 way still holds up. Yeah. Uh, and then Artemi says, Diablo 3 is 60 frames per second on Switch and looks pretty good. Uh, I did see comments uh, that, yes, it apparently is 60 frames. We said yeah. it was 30. Or yeah. Something. So apparently it runs good. I don't know. Uh, sorry about that. All right. Now we're in the chat and we got a subscription from this guy, Beat'em Ups. Hey, this is a question for Will. How have you been, man? <laughs> I miss you. Uh, and for Bob, Val tonight or? Yeah, that's probably Val. I miss you too, Wood. I'm doing okay. I'm hanging in there. I'm, I'm all right. Nobody worry about me. No, I don't know <laughs> if anybody is. Um, Ajax says, Bob, I saw a 3D printed MagSafe and NFC iPhone vertical joy con mount. I, uh, NFC? I am working on a video this week about, uh, uh it's about the Razer Kishi Ultra, but I'm right. making it about, uh, controllers for the phone. So I might, uh, dabble into that. You know, I'm going to open it on the tab. Oh, you like tap? Okay, let me show that on screen. 
you like tap the phone to it and it automatically opens Delta. That's interesting. Cool. That's pretty cool. That is cool. I I've been working on a vertical mount for Joy-Cons. Mm-hmm. Uh and I've been working on something where it slides in. For a switch or no, for the phone. Okay. And I never considered just making it MagSafe. Yeah. And I have all of these things like my N D filter and, and some other controller adapter that I made MagSafe. Yeah. I never considered making that you one. You know, MagSafe. I like the worst part about having an iPhone eleven is that the 12 is when they introduced MagSafe. So I just missed it. All these things like work with it. But you have um, wireless charging, don't yes. you? Yes. My wife, I got my wife a MagSafe case and a MagSafe battery pack, and that works on it. I was going to say, you can get the MagSafe sticker. I know, but like I would, do ha- that. I would have to know like exactly where to put oh, it. Oh, it's easy. How easy? You put it on the charger. Okay. You put the you take the mag safe. Yeah. You take the stickers off. You put it on the charger, and then you put your phone over it like that. <laughs> okay. Where it lines up. Yeah, yeah. And just do that. All right. Also, it just goes over the the, the, the Apple logo know, is yeah. the middle. So yeah. You, you'll I be able that to figure much. it out. It shouldn't be too hard. Yeah. Uh, thoughts on basil ice cream? What the fuck? <laughs> Hey, I'd try it. I don't. Ew, uh, dude. What the no, fuck? I don't like. No. But this is. My, I'll try. Hey, I'll try it. Oh my god. This is. This is my like Mr. Incredible and the Incredibles two, where he's yelling at his kid because they changed math. <laughs> this is my. <laughs> they changed math. This is not ice cream. I I would give it a try. Uh, where do I get basil ice cream? I don't want to know. Will, have you watched The Acolyte or The Boys yet? Only, see, only episode one of The Acolyte. I do want to finish it. I have not watched The Boys. I see enough of it in my timeline to get a sense of what's going on. It oh. looks good, though. Maybe one day I will actually sit down and watch it. And maybe monkeys will fly on my butt. I don't know. I'm a little interested in The Acolyte. Yeah. Bob, what did you get from Too Many Games this weekend? I unfortunately didn't get to walk around like as much as i would have liked to i did ask a lot of people for broken uh game boys and yeah. nobody had broken game Boys. really or any so a lot of places didn't have any game boys really um the one person i got broken game boys from last year uh uh-huh. didn't have any but they gave me a cool little coin with a big middle finger on it <laughs> um i asked one place and they said we don't have any broken game boys we only brought our best stuff but people keep asking us for the broken game boys and i was like yeah you probably should have brought the broken yeah. game boys um what else oh somebody gave me a whole ass donkey kong game and watch <laughs> so was like here you go <laughs> okay i was like oh my god thank yeah. you so much uh and then i bought an nes advantage controller because it was 20 bucks oh wow nice uh, that was cool that's it that's, uh, that's pretty much all i got saw something uh fizzwidgy uh, how do you feel about the practice of adding achievements to retro games? Oh, I should say two different people gave me bags of coffee also. There you go. Adding achievements to retro games? Yeah. I think it's really cool, and that's a thing that exists with yes. emulation and stuff. It's awesome. Uh, I, I never do it because I don't care that much about it. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, I think it's smart to do, but I don't know anybody who cares about achievements anymore. I know people who who like having the retro achievements and put it on all of their devices. And stuff. Yeah. Uh, and it's integrated into Emu Deck and stuff. Yeah, if, I just I don't really play retro games like that. I guess I don't play any games like that anymore. Like yeah, if I true. play a game, like if I get an achievement, it's like, oh hey, look at that. Like I don't look at the list and go, okay, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do this. Like, well, there's certain games like Mario Wonder right. that I hundred percented because I love that game. Uh, that game doesn't have any fucking achievements, yeah. <laughs> so it's not for the achievements, I guess. Right. Uh, but retro games, I play. I mean, I, I've usually it's games that I've already played before, right. so getting the achievements doesn't really matter to me. Yeah. Bob, Will, it's been a few weeks by now, but did you see the Sonic Symphony that was in New York City? No, I didn't even I know didn't, it was here. I had no idea. I would have wanted to go. Yeah. Um. 
Game Explain released a video last sa Saturday titled Nintendo's prices are whack and wanted to know your take on it because I think Nintendo is charging too much for the HD ports. Yeah, they are. Yeah. They are charging a lot. Uh, but, what, what was it? It was $60 for Donkey Kong, but Metroid Prime was like 40 Yeah, it's weird. They're yeah. doing weird things with their prices. Yeah, I don't understand. They're going to charge what they can get away with, and unfortunately, they're going to away yeah. with a lot. And it stinks that like, you know, they keep their prices so high. Like they don't really put anything on sale anymore. Like their first party stuff doesn't really go on sale. And when it is, it's not for a significant amount. You know, I remember back in the day, they used to have the player's choice line of games where like they would lower the price to $20 and it was great because you could pick up a game you missed for like a good price. And they don't have anything like that. anymore. Holy Lettuce says, Bob, what made you decide to hold a mic in your video? Uh, it has been interesting to see. Uh... Part of it is that it's just easy. Just instead of setting up like a stand, I can just hold it. But also, uh, there's something weird uh, about like uh, my videos are relatively high quality, mm -hmm. and there's something weird that's like a disconnect for people. Like if it feels too professional, that's why you see people on TikTok with a lav mic and they're holding it yeah. or they're like talking into their phone or they're doing something like that because it's like a weird like yeah. way to like seem more like I saw human. somebody once uh, take the, you know, the headset mic for your iPhone and attach a lav mic to that and oh. hold that. <laughs> oh, uh, Eddie Burback. Didn't he do that? No, he holds like a... It's not a Yeti it was either mic. Eddie Burback, Gus Johnson, or uh, Nakey Jakey. One of right. them did did that. I this was like I don't know if it was supposed to be. It wasn't a parody. Like this was in earnest. It was like a YouTube short, and he was holding it like that. But that's a bit of a silly reason. Hey, I didn't tell you it was a good reason. But that's a thing. Like yeah. when I I started doing it uh, when we would shoot TikToks, I would do something weird like hold a mic or something yeah. because. Uh, it would look like an ad otherwise. Yeah. Because the video looks too good. And you're scrolling through TikTok, you see iPhone video, iPhone video, yeah. iPhone video, cinema camera. Oh, that must be an ad. Yeah. So if I'm doing something that's wrong, like holding a microphone, uh, it looks, uh, I guess, more human. That's why YouTubers will include the clap in the beginning of the video to make it look more authentic than, you know. Look at me. I'm just like you guys. Yeah. Put my pants on one leg at a time. Wood says one of them attached their mic to a wooden spoon once and just held the spoon for the whole There thing. you go. There's a guy, uh, I think he's, yeah, he's on YouTube. I saw him review uh, USB chargers. That's what he was, he was reviewing a bunch of USB chargers. Okay. It was just a regular video of him at his desk, but... He had his dog in a chair next to him, and the dog had a little tie on, and the dog sat like this, staring at him, <laughs> the whole ten minute video, and didn't move. For the, and he's sitting there talking, and the dog's just like this. <laughs> anyway, that's it. Okay, I love your work, lads. Any thoughts on uh, decent slash not too expensive three hundred and sixty or PS three handheld emulation in the future? No, I've never really fucked around with that because uh, it's really finicky and doesn't work. Yeah, that well, especially I, handheld. I would say your best option, like I say for everything, is the Steam Deck because you can do 360 and PS3 emulation. Yeah, I saw Deck. a video on like how to get 360 emulation working on a Steam Deck, and I'm curious to try it. But I feel like once you start doing like that era, you're you know things get a little bit janky, more janky than like the older stuff. Yeah, it's not going to be good. It's yeah. it's hard. It's very difficult to emulate that generation yeah. by design because they. Didn't want you to play those games on any other hardware. Well, a 360 is a power PC uh, processor. So that's like a common PC component that like people can emulate, you know, easier than, you know, what the PS3 was running Yeah, the PS3 of. was notoriously hard, but the Xbox yeah. 360 wasn't exactly easy. Right, no. All right. That's it. Thanks for hanging out, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for watching us. Thank you for chatting with us. As always, the Wolfden Podcast is every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern right here on twitch.tv slash Wolfden and youtube.com slash Wolfden Podcast. If you can't make the show for any reason at all, we always put it up as an archive version over on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Wolfden Podcast. So you can go and check us out over there 
on demand whenever you want. If you prefer to listen to us rather than watch us, you can do that as well because we're also an audio podcast on any and every podcast service such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube Podcasts, audible.com. But no matter where you get this show from, folks, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and review us because that helps us with placement on all of those respective platforms. I forgot to thank Tough Bananas for the two months and Anthony Melee with 100 bits. You know, this show, I'm going to ban you. Uh, <laughs> go watch AJ. He's streaming Pokemon. Uh, I will see you. I don't know when I'm going to see you because maybe tomorrow night, maybe Wednesday, but uh, I got a lot of things to do. And Thursday is uh, for the job. Yes, 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 I did. Uh, but I think I'm going to have a video out on Friday because the sponsor won't let me upload on the 4th of July. <laughs> I would have liked to, but yeah. they won't let me. Uh, so I'll have a video out on Friday. But next stream, who knows? Bye. Bye.